so we're very pleased to have Lydia Bieri here um, giving this week's colloquium. Um, Lydia uh, comes from Ann Arbor, Michigan, where in addition to being a professor in the math department, she's the director of the Michigan Center for Applied and Interdisciplinary Mathematics, which goes by its acronym McCain, M-C-A-I-N. Uh, but today she's going to talk to us about um, new structures in gravitational waves. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mike. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming and the invitation. So I'm going to give this talk from a mathematical perspective, but I want to motivate the, math, the physical questions behind uh, this topic as well. So it's going to be about structures in gravitational waves, some new structures that we have found recently. And so maybe at the beginning, I want to give you a little bit of the philosophy of what we do in mathematical general relativity. So this is certainly around the Einstein equations. We investigate the manifolds and our solutions of the Einstein equations, which couple the geometry of the space time of the universe to its physical content. And from a mathematical point of view, what we do, so this is really a beautiful, let's say, set of equations I will go into in a moment that uh, have beautiful geometric and uh, mathematical structures which have physical meaning. And so what we do from the mathematical side, you want some initial data and you want to, let's say, let uh, this initial data evolve under the Einstein equations and see what kind of space times, what classes of space time solutions can you produce? So what kind of singularities occur under what conditions, et cetera. So this is the Cauchy problem approach. And so in the last decades, I think geometric analysis has been really uh, very uh, successful in not only tackling some of the most important problems, but also actually solving really big questions in GR. Um, so I'll mention a few of them as we go along. And certainly one of the big, uh, let's say, uh, breakthroughs on the observational side was the detection of gravitational waves in 2015 by LIGO. And since then, so the LIGO-Virgo collaboration has detected or found many uh, more events of gravitational waves uh, from binary black hole, binary neutron star mergers, and so on. So what I'm going to talk about is basically structures in gravitational waves. I want to say what kind of, let's say, data does uh, create what kind of classes of space times under the Einstein equations, and what kind of, let's say, information can we read off from radiation. For instance, if you have two black, black holes that spiral in, around and merge, they will send out gravitational waves. And we are, can think of uh, ourselves as sitting far away from that source. So these waves will travel along so-called null hypersurfaces or light cones in the space time and reach us at the very, at the, after a very long time. And there's information encoded in this uh, radiation. And the interesting thing is what are the mathematical structures that actually evolve up to what we call infinity. At, I will introduce that in a moment. So we are basically at what we call null infinity that I will define in a moment of such a space time. And when we look at these waves, we're looking backwards in time, basically along these light cones. So we want to have information about these sources. And uh, interesting enough, there are really new structures that we have found. So if you think, for instance, of black holes in a vacuum or in almost vacuum out in space, so these are the type of sources that have been really studied a lot. And there are certain, let's say, there's a lot of knowledge about these kind of sources. Still, a lot is missing. But if you look at these sources, let's say, in an in a almost vacuum, then there's certain patterns that by various techniques people have uh, found. And uh, we hope to see many of them in, in future observations. But if you allow, let's say, uh, sources of a different type, if you embed, for instance, what happens often is that you have a huge neutrino cloud present around these black holes, then these gravitational radiation um, structures will change in some way. And some of these new structures are very, um, uh, let's say, are emerged from the Einstein equations, even in the vacuum case. And so I will talk a little bit about that. So here, first you have on the one side, uh, that's an artistic picture of two black holes merging and so waves sent away. And on the other side, you'll hear 
have a, a picture from the Event Horizon Telescope where, I mean, this is a Harvard uh, red uh, collaboration with Shep Dolman from Astrophysics being the, the founding director. So here you see really the first picture taking of a supermassive black hole in the galaxy M87. So you should think of um, black holes of several stellar masses. So that's what we're talking about in LIGO um, at the center of the sources, so merging and sending out gravitational waves. So this is a supermassive black hole that's much bigger. So anyway, so here are the Einstein equations. And so the way we think about them is that on the left-hand side, you have all the geometric information. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna talk about only four dimensional space times in this talk. So we have the Ricci curvature, the metric, um, um, the metric tensor here, and the scalar curvature of the manifold that we're going to find on the left hand side. So you can think of this as the geometric part, which is coupled to the um, energy momentum tensor stress energy of any field that I would like to couple into. So for instance, if you have a neutron star, there will be electromagnetic field, fields present, or if you want to model um, certain uh, situations in the universe by some fluid or gas, so then you would plug in the corresponding uh, components on the right hand side, and you also have to add the matter or energy equations for that field. So in this talk, I will mainly focus on the Einstein vacuum equations. If you put the right hand side to zero, the Einstein equations will reduce to what we call the Einstein vacuum equations. And already here, we have a lot of interesting structure. And even here, uh, for instance, in 2008, Christodoulou showed that from the focusing of gravitational waves, black holes can form under just the bare Einstein vacuum equations. So there's a lot of interesting dynamics in these equations per se that we would like to investigate today. Uh, you can extend, I extended the findings I will present today to the Einstein equations where we prescribe neutrino radiation. So one way to do that, I mean, neutrino have a very small mass, but we can describe them in a, in a good model by a null fluid. So we can plug in a null fluid with certain properties on the right hand side and obtain a good description of <clears throat> neutrino radiation coupled to the Einstein equations. So I'll only say a few things about this at the very end. So, but maybe first, just generally for the Einstein equations, I mean, the Einstein equations themselves decouple into a set of evolution equations, which we can put into hyperbolic form and a set of constrained equations. And if you go to the very early days, it was already Darmois in a very special circumstance, namely for the analytic case, um, where he found that actually this um, initial data that you gave need to, to fulfill part of the Einstein equations called the constraints. So you cannot just give certain type of data. This data has to fulfill one portion of the Einstein equations, which are the constraints. So here, um, you have, let's say, the first function here in front of the time component, that's what you call the lapse function. And then you have a shift vector here in, uh, in front of this component. I'm, I'm gonna put the shift to zero in, in this talk. So what happens is, I mean, if you look at the Einstein equations, they provide you six, uh, a system of six independent equations for a set of 10 unknowns for the metric. So you have a degree of freedom of four to make uh, some choices and to make coordinate transformation. So that's perfect. So from the mathematical point of view, so I can choose um, my data up to that degree of freedom. And from a physical point of view, you want to have <clears throat> the same physical laws um, all over the place. So it doesn't matter where you are in the space time. So if matter is present, then as I said, you add the matter or energy part in the stress energy and you have to supply also the extra equations. Like for instance, if this is an Einstein Maxwell equations for an electromagnetic field, so you would have the Einstein Maxwell system. But here we're going to just talk about the Einstein vacuum for the most part of the talk. So initial data for uh, the Einstein equations in this case will be the three-dimensional manifold I call H. <clears throat> And a complete Riemannian metric, I will denote by G bar and a symmetric two tensor K, that's gonna be the second fundamental form later. And again, if matter fields are present, you need uh, to specify all the initial conditions for those. And all this data has to fulfill the constraint equations. So what we aim to do is we find the Cauchy development. So we solve the evolution equations 
And the Cauchy development of that data will be a globally hyperbolic space time, which solves the Einstein equations. And we have the corresponding embedding of our initial manifold into the space time manifold I will call M. Well, maybe just briefly, I didn't mention the, the this is just the constraints. You can show that they propagate, that was shown by Darmois and then by Jorge Bruyère in the general case. So here I just added the cosmological constant, but I'm going to omit that. If you want to talk about cosmology, then you would uh, add a cosmological term to the Einstein equations. But here, this is just zero for us. Uh, just to show you how things look like. So if I evolve now this initial data, I can say, well, I have some time function. And if I evolve the initial data G bar and K, so that, that will uh, look like this. Phi here is now my lapse function. And here I call the X vector, X is the shift vector. And this L is just the lead derivatives with respect to this shift vector X of these components. And everything with the bar means it's on a space-like hypersurface. All right, so this looks at first sight, you could say, I mean, it's always, I'm always astonished by how, I mean, compact and, and neat the Einstein equations look. And if you go deeper into the details, there's a lot of beautiful structures that we find. So for today's talk, I will not talk about cosmology, but uh, rather for um, about asymptotically flat systems. So you can think of a galaxy or maybe two black holes that, well, if you want to model uh, how these things evolve how, uh, under the Einstein equations, these objects, you can think of them as being asymptotically flat. So you can think the next large object is far away. So we can assume that the space time is asymptotically flat, which means exactly this. I will give you more exact data in a moment. But um, outside of a sufficiently large compact set K, so your um, complement here is diffeomorphic to the complement of a closed ball in R3. And your metric and second fundamental form will decay fast enough. And this fast enough is what I'm going to uh, concentrate in the second part of my talk. What does that mean? So um, just about one word about the concept of global hyperbolicity. So for physical questions, you don't want time loops or anything like that to occur. So we talk about um, global hyperbolicity in the following sense. So MG will admit a Cauchy hypersurface. That's my Lorentzian space time that I'm looking for, or classes of space times. And so that's basically a complete space like hypersurface H in M, where each causal curve in the space time intersects H exactly once. So not zero, not twice, just once. So that's what we call global hyperbolicity. And so the maximal Cauchy development is then given in a unique way. So that's a result by Jogé Bruyard and Girache of the uh, late uh, 60s. And that's given in a unique way, um, <coughs> excuse me, as the globally hyperbolic space time into which all other space times embed asymmetrically. So let me maybe give you this as a, as a theorem. The second theorem is the one I just mentioned, but I would like to, because this is a, such a fundamental result, cite Chukabuya's 52 result, namely the well postness for the Einstein equations. So it's interesting always to point out it took a lot of time. So there was a lot of success on the physics and observation side in GR, but it took up to 52 by a lot of work of a lot of mathematicians to evolve to the well postness result of Ivan Chukabuya saying that if you have initial data, HT bar K, satisfying now the constraint equations that I mentioned. So then there does exist a space time which solves the Einstein equations and you have the corresponding embedding of H into M. So that we mentioned. And of course, so this uh, um, uniqueness of this globally hyperbolic, um, uh, this Cauchy development is then the result of her with Bob Garrosh in 69. But of course, the, this is a, a really great result, but it does not tell you anything about singularities or behavior of solution, but you have a well postness result and this result uh, about the Cauchy development. Now, let me just very briefly, because it's, I think it helps understand where uh, the hyperbolicity uh, comes from, how things look like, just uh, the main ideas of that proof. That's also where wave coordinates were introduced by, or used by Jacques Bouillard. So when you write these equations down in wave coordinates, so this is just the box operator with respect to the corresponding metric. 
So your coordinates are wave coordinates, they fulfill this equation. So then your equations, the Anson equations actually reduce to a very simple form of uh, wave equations. So you get a wave equation of that uh, form number eight, where on the right hand side, I'm not gonna give you the details, but this is now the right hand side are the nonlinear terms, which are quadratic in nabla chi. So you have a quasi-linear set of wave equations. So basically this is the main idea together with the domain of dependence theorem to prove the well process. All right, so today we're gonna use um, the following. So I will, um, in my work, I will choose a time function where the trace of K will be zero. So we call it a maximal time function. So I will call, I will use mainly two foliations of the space time, one naturally given by our time function. And if you look at each time step, you have complete Riemannian hypersurfaces and a null hypersurface, um, or an, I will also introduce a, a, let's say a function U, which you can think of a function which solves the iconal equation. So this is a function that gives me a foliation of the space time into null hypersurfaces. And of course you have more structures. This is just an abstract view. There's a lot of structure in here. You can think of this as generalized light cones. And for many of the things, when we are locally looking at the Einstein equations and the dynamics, what's happening, I may um, sit on, let's say, locally on a two-dimensional um, uh, surface. So if I intersect such a space like with a null hypersurface, that gives me a two-dimensional surface, which is diffeomorphic to a sphere here. So I will call this STU. All right. Now, let me maybe just give you very basic details that we need to understand what, uh, what I, I will do next. So I will use a foliation uh, with a T and a U function. Now L is going to be a vector field that will generate if I go out here, it will generate the outgoing null hypersurfaces and L bar will generate incoming null hypersurfaces, just very briefly. So, and the metric uh, G of L bar is giving me minus two. So L and L bar are orthogonal to the surface S and these are my null directions. And I will call the outgoing null direction E4 and the incoming null direction E3. So this will be important when we uh, decompose our curvature and geometry with respect to that foliation. So when I don't talk about the null frame, I have this outgoing and incoming null vector fields uh, complemented with a orthonormal free field on the surfaces STU. So this is the frame I'm going to use. And just to give you um, an idea, so I can write down now what we call shears. So I have, of course, the second fundamental form with respect to the outgoing, with respect to the incoming null directions. And I will denote them by chi, respectively chi bar for the incoming. And I'm going to tell you this already here because this will play an important role later. The traceless parts of these uh, second fundamental forms are the shears, and they play an important role in uh, describing gravitational radiation. So that's going to be an important point. And the traces of these um, are the so called expansion scalars. So just as a side note, typically these traces, the, in, the trace chi bar is negative, the trace chi is typically positive, but if the trace chi is going to be negative, so that will give you um, the characterization of a closed trapped surface, which is really important in black hole formation, but that's not what we'll talk about today. So in certain space times, um, maybe you forget about uh, the notion here, but in certain space times, um, this chi hat will have direct limits at null infinity. The chi hat bar always has a limit at null infinity, but this will give us insight into gravitational radiation. And for fast decaying space, um, initial data, this will be all well defined and no problem. For data that is really spread out, that is very not um, with, with a very slow fall off that I'm interested in this talk, this will not be defined, this sigma. So, but there will be interesting information about these terms. Let me introduce what I mean by future null infinity. So when something happens like a binary black hole merger and gravitation waves are sent out, they will travel along these null hypersurfaces that I just introduced as CU. And future null infinity is then defined to be the endpoints of all future directed null geodesics along which R is um, going to infinity. And it has a topology of R cross S2. So at each, let's say, value for U, my uh, hypersurface CU intersects this future I plus at the sphere, at, at the two sphere, at null infinity. 
So this is where we make observations and we want to understand what happens when, uh, what, what survives from the really big, uh, let's say, dynamics, interesting dynamics in a binary black hole merges, for instance, at null infinity for different types of data. So uh, let me cite here a result by Chris Dulo and Kleinerman from the 90s, which um, is important uh, in that sense, because um, there has been, in, let's say, a lot of um, insights from these stability proofs into dynamics of large data questions. So let me maybe first cite what these um, proofs tell you. So Chris Dulo and Kleinemann showed that if you have asymptotically flat initial data, which are, I mean, under a certain smallness assumption on the data, um, that you can produce complete space times tending again to Minkowski at infinity along any geodesic. So meaning there's no singularity, so you get a, a, a global um, asymptotically flat space time. And so there were many generalizations. So Nina Sipser generalized this for the Einstein Maxwell equations. I generalized this for Einstein vacuum to the borderline decay. And there's a lot of work that just got into this area. Let me maybe cite mine um, result also just in a very brief way. I'm not going into the details here because that would take too much time, but in a more general setting, um, I also showed, let's say you have data which is decaying very, very slowly, which will be precise in the next slide towards infinity. And still, so you have um, a relaxed data in the sense, very, very slowly decaying to, uh, to Minkowski, and yet you can still produce a globally, um, a global solution which is asymptotically flat and no singularities occur. So why is this important, this type of uh, space times? Well, first of all, you may say, oh, you have small data to ensure existence, but we want to talk about large data. Well, the small data ensured existence of, uh, uh, in, in this setting, but you can actually go to large data and find that many of the results, especially the very precise decay estimates that get out of these uh, uh, proofs, are still true. So basically the behavior along null hypersurfaces is really independent from the smallness. So I will say more about that later, but the, the, the thing is I'm gonna now invest, I'm gonna build the next work that I'm gonna talk about on some of these space times that have been proven um, for which decay estimates have been proven in a rog rigorous way. So to tell you what this looks like, so if you translate, let's say, the, the long theorem that I didn't show you into initial data and decay estimates, let us look first maybe at the second half, the crystal global Kleinerman space times. So they had initial data when you go, uh, let's, let's say you let R go to infinity. So then you have an asymptotic behavior that looks like chi bar, like one plus two M over R, delta IJ plus here it is o, uh, little o four of R to minus three halves and correspondingly for K. So this, um, this is the, what you call the D or Crisula Kleinemann space times. And a lot of information has been gained uh, using the results by Crisula Kleinemann also for large data space times. So what I looked at is this type of space times here in, in the first, first half. So let's call them B in the, in, so I have A, B, C, D, uh, a few more, but let's call this data B. And what here is different, so have less decay, just R to the minus one half and less derivatives. And it turns out that this R to the minus one half decay here is, is actually really crucial. And when I look at space times and plug in large data and investigate gravitational waves in that regime, there's a lot more, in, uh, there's a lot of more of interesting structures than if you go and look at space times of that type. Let me maybe introduce a little bit more of different types of data just to distinguish a little bit. So, you could also look at, instead of the crystal Kleinemann, you could say, oh, let's, there's some sort of a spherical symmetry sitting in there. If you just look at space times, which are, let's say, Lij is homogeneous of degree minus one, and just you have some R to the minus one minus epsilon decay of the rest. So then still, these are space times that um, decay fast enough so that, let's say, what we have done investigated so far in, in gravitational radiation. So this will all go into that regime. So there's a lot of structures that are very common in, in, in these. So I will also call A, so if you look at the situation B here and replace little o by big O, then you come into a regime that I will call A and no stability result is known for that, but um, we will just include that with some conjectures for this situation and some um, support material for those. So here, let me say maybe a few words about why, again, is this interesting and why does it actually work? 
So if I look at this D or B space times, for those we have stability theorems which give us precise decay estimates for the for these kind of for these classes of space times. So now why can we put in large data? So it follows you can actually prove a, a simple corollary that there exists a complete domain of dependence of the complement of a sufficiently large compact subset of the initial hypersurface. So with other words, for this part of future null infinity, we have a complete um, understanding by these proofs how these space times look like. So with other words, so these um, space times are a good ground, playground to build on to investigate gravitational radiation for various systems. Okay, so these are the type of data that we want to introduce or actually look at. Maybe here just briefly, um, the pies are here, this are projection operators. So here we have the wild curvature. I'm just decomposing the wild curvature with respect to the foliation I showed you. Um, I, I have a nicer slide just in a moment, but the pi here is a projection operator from your four dimensional space time onto the local two dimensional surfaces I call STU. And these are components which are then basically tangent to these local surfaces. And these are curvature components with um, different decay estimates. And we'll see they will play some interesting roles. So as I just said before, if you have data, by the way, of type B, so this is still in a regime where the total energy is actually finite, but your total angular momentum diverges in all the, the in all the other settings where you have at least the one over R decay of the tail of the metric, you always have finite angular momentum. And the data A type, so that is where you do not have any uh, proofs actually for stability, et cetera. So the total energy there is no longer finite. So that's really kind of a special case in that sense where we, you enter a different regime. Okay, so maybe very, very briefly. So this is maybe a better slide than the one previously. So if I contract twice, let's say my curvature component uh, that with the uh, incoming null, uh, null geodesic vector field. So that's what I call 3-3. Three, three. So this is going to be curvature component alpha bar. So depending on how I contract things, I have different kinds of components. And you could think of the leading order curvature component as alpha bar, then the next order beta bar, et cetera. So maybe this is more helpful here. So if you look at the Christodoulou Kleinemann space time, so they find that at null infinity, when you go and sit at null infinity, your space time has a certain behavior, a decay behavior in this curvature components. So basically the leading order term decays like r to the minus one. And so this tau minus is nothing else. So I have one plus u squared, u is this optical function. This is what I call tau minus squared. So I have a tau minus, this is like a U decay, if you like, sitting here, and I have certain behavior. And what we, we will talk about this row and sigma parts a lot in the second half of the talk, and we don't need so much the rest here. But you see, if you have um, a lot of initial, let's say if your initial data decays fast already, then you, you recover some of this um, decay Towards, um, towards Minkowski space in, in how your components decay to, of the curvature decay. And in, my, in the B space times that I looked at, so you have a very slow decay of these. And basically what you see also, um, we don't get the R to the minus three decay, but everything else is just like R to the minus five halves. And this is at first sight a problem to investigate any gravitational radiation because you do need let's say a little bit more of the structures to survive at null infinity to say anything. But the interesting thing is we can go and delve deeper into these structures. And there's a lot of really interesting structures that are um, hiding behind that, that we will see, which has some implications in gravitational radiation. Just a little bit, uh, maybe just the upper half needs to be recorded. The rest is maybe just folklore. But if I have the chi hat, so this, I, I told you the chi hat and chi hat bar are the two shears which will actually um, be important for the gravitational radiation discussion. So for the physicists in the, in the audience, the chi hat bar will be uh, related to our new, to the news tensor. So the chi hat itself, the case like R to the minus three halves, and again, so that might be problematic. The chi hat bar has certain decay behavior, et cetera. C does just a torsion one form. So maybe things to remember is just that there is a specific decay for the shear, so that's all. 
So here are some relations. Now, when we are looking at the Einstein equations, let's say locally, and we try to see what's going on. So we can, we have to, let's say, get estimates for our solutions, et cetera. And locally, there's an interesting relation between the two shears. So um, chi hat and chi hat bar, and I can write down like this. And chi hat bar has another relation here with alpha bar, that's the leading order curvature component. And there's lower order terms that will actually you have to show that you can control them. So I don't even show them here. Okay, interesting for us will also be that, of course, the divergences of these um, shears, and this is the slash, by the way, the slash operator means it's an operator defined on that, in the tan that sphere. So we are the, uh, tangentially to the sphere here. So this is on the sphere, and the chi hat um, and the chi hat bar solve these equations, which relates them to the curvature in, in an important way. So these are uh, just for the moment some of the structural equations that we will use. And maybe here from this slide, we just need the lower part. I will introduce a bit more of notation. So there's a lot of interesting, um, let's say, structures. We can introduce something called the signature here, and the signature is just the uh, numbers of contractions with the outgoing vector field minus the number of contractions with the incoming vector field. And when I introduce that, so I will uh, use this to define here something, uh, some notation I will use in the next slides. So first of all, Xi, if this is any null component of an arbitrary wild tensor, then d slash 3 of Xi and d slash 4 of Xi, these are projections to STU, as I just mentioned. So you have, let's say, the the derivatives um, with respect to the three and the four vector fields, and now you project them onto the surfaces STU, and that's denoted by this slash. But I will um, combine another term here. So I will introduce, I will combine this tra trace chi bar and the trace chi times this, uh, this wild curvature into what I call here xi three and xi four. That's just a technicality. So this is what it means. And it's interesting that when we talk about the Einstein equation, so there's the so-called Bianchi equations, which give us um, correlations or connections between the curvature components and the rich, the, the other uh, geometric quantities. So what is important here, so you see rho is a curvature component we will concentrate on, sigma is another curvature component we'll concentrate on, and when I take these derivatives, that's um, actually connected with uh, the beta bar curvature component and lower order terms. So this will be important. So we'll only, we can show that we can control the lower order terms, but the Bianchi equations will be really important in what we're going to do. All right. So maybe just uh, to tell you a little bit about um, some of these structures, when you look at the shear chi hat that you see, you have a leading order component that decays like r to minus three halves, so you don't get a limit at null infinity, but we need to understand something which is underneath this structure. And so for the fast decaying space times, you have limits of these components at null infinity. Everything looks nice and you have relatively simple, let's say, structures in gravitational waves. Well, simple, they're st still intriguing, but uh, certain structures in gravitational waves. And now for the very slowly decaying space times, there's other things coming in. Let me explain what um, uh, I mean here by dynamical and non-dynamical parts. So for instance, um, as a result of, um, uh, of, of my older proof and um, a, a corollary, if you want, some of the things I just showed you, the chi hat and chi hat bar have structures like that. What do I mean by these uh, brackets here? So this first bracket means that this denotes a part of the uh, of these components, which are not dynamical, which means they are, do not depend on you. So you can think you go to null infinity, and if you if you uh, have a non-dynamical part, it does not evolve with you, which is also what we call the retarded time in, in physics. All right, there's other structures here. So if I have this um, curly bracket, so this means there's a dependence on you, and there are more dynamics in there. Let me explain what that means just um, in the next slide. So first of all, one remark about smallness assumption. So if you go back to my original proof, there's a smallness assumption on the curvature, the derivatives of the curvatures of rho and sigma, which give me a, a certain decay of these curvature components, the derivatives, et cetera. So if you have small data, you get, um, for small data, you have, you get a certain structure, which I have here in 48 and 49, 
But if you have large data, so the interesting thing is that some of the structures still are the same, but for large data, you don't have this um, smallest assumptions for large data, you have more terms showing up, which have the case like arch to the minus five halves and some UDK, which do not have limits at null infinity. So everything here, which is not arch to the minus three, will not have a limit at null infinity and, and will kind of break uh, things for us. So we cannot extract any information. So the next slide is actually important in what what happens here? How do we delve deeper into the structures and get over the barrier of these non-dynamical parts? So uh, I give you the example for the chi hat. So certain quantities here, which are defined locally on, on a, a surface surface STU, there's no problem with that. They do not attain a corresponding limited null infinity. What do I mean? I'm sitting on one null hypersurface, let t go to infinity. And what you expect is that there should be a nice limit at null infinity, which has some meaning. So, however, for this, um, let's say, leading non-dynamical parts, we do not have that. However, you can show that the difference of their values at very close by cones do have a limit at null infinity. So you can think of the surfaces as I'm sitting on a cone CU, there's a neighboring cone with CU zero, and I'm, I'm picking out a surface S like STU, I call it SU, SU zero, and a point on that sphere. And now I'm going to actually um, connect these points on these spheres with an incoming uh, null geodesic. So for instance, if I have chi hat, so then what do we do? We just take we, this R squared times chi hat does not have a limit. What we do now, we take a point on such a sphere, SU or diffeomorphic to a sphere in a cone CU. I go to the neighboring cone. And on a corresponding surface, I can also point, uh, pick a corresponding point. So the difference of the limit at these points of chi hat does tend to a limit, and the limit turns out to be this object. So I take the derivative, the slash three derivative of chi hat, and I integrate here with respect to the incoming null vector field from my u zero up to u. These are the values at null infinity. It's like um, that I get there. And that is the limit which is well defined. And I can show that these um, things have that limit. So with other words, the leading order part like r to minus three halves that does not tend to a limit is non-dynamical. And similarly, this happens also for the curvature parts, the rho and the sigma. And again, I can show that the corresponding, let's say uh, values on nearby hypersurfaces do tend to a limit. And that's really important. That's where the dynamical part lies. All right. So, I mean, from my old theorems, you get some limits at null infinity of some curvature components. Maybe I don't stick here, but show you this. And lately, so um, when investigating now large data, so I've shown um, last year that if I take now, remember row three is the three derivative of the curvature component row, which is related to what we will call electric part of the wild curvature. I have not yet defined that. And sigma will be related to what we call magnetic part of the wild curvature. <clears throat> so the wild curvature can be decomposed into some sort of electric and magnetic part. So our name's just here. But it turns out that when you look deeper into these structures, so there are there are certain type, I call this A uh, sub rho, A sub sigma. So this portion here will cancel in the Bianchi equation. So the Bianchi equations will tell us what's going to happen out at null infinity. So <clears throat> these will cancel, but then there are a bunch of other structures on the right hand side. Let me just give them names. So what I have here will actually impact the gravitational radiation. And now there are more structures in these parts of these curvature components than if you have a space time which is fastly, uh, fast decaying. So if you have a slow decaying fast space time like the space, space times, these are new structures which are not present otherwise. We will go into that in a moment, but just to tell you whatever uh, we have here on the right hand side, I don't want to show you too many details, but just to say that this rho one half, sigma one half, rho beta, sigma beta, they do tend to limit. So I multiply this by r to the three, and I take the limit at null infinity, and I call this um, math. So this is the curly r and the curly s. So they tend to limit, and these limits have a certain decay behavior as indicated here in terms of u. So u is the um, function, the retarded time at null infinity. And with respect to that, we have certain type of behavior. 
Okay, but now what does this all have to do with gravitational radiation and uh, the so-called memory effect, which I will now introduce. So when you have gravitational waves coming from a source like here, black holes, so then you can think in a mathematical way, you can think of this source itself evolving on some time-like uh, uh, path, but they will send out gravitational waves like here along this null hypersurfaces. And we are here, this is I plus, so that's our future null infinity, where we do observe gravitational waves. Now, there's a lot of interesting dynamics happening here. What is actually surviving up at null infinity and what kind of dynamics can we recover up there in gravitational radiation? So what is gravitational radiation? It's nothing else but the change or fluctuation of the curvature of the space-time propagating along these this null hypersurfaces. So if you think of a typical source like a binary black hole merger, so in a fraction of a second, this wave train will travel through where we are and change the space on here, and then we will go back to whatever we were in before, sort of. So you can think of this, how do we, when you are far away from the source, then we can say, all right, so then if for the purpose of simplification of the discussion, let's assume the wave comes from a direction which is orthogonal to the plane that I have uh, just depicted here. And so then these three test masses here, so what, what is actually happening? I can think, let's pick out three geodesics in my space time and see how they move with respect to each other. And in an experiment like LIGO, you put test masses, which are actually mirrors, you put test masses as markers for these geodesics. So these geodesics of the space time are moving and you know beautifully from simple uh, differential um, geometry that well we have the geodesic equation and the Jacobi equation that will actually uh, give us the, how these geodesics will move given the curvature changes. And that's really the simple idea which is behind this experiment. Well, a simple idea, but a lot of, let's say, extremely uh, difficult engineering and difficult mathematical structures which go into what are we actually finding? What do we expect? But at the end, so this is really beautiful how things come together in, a, in, a, in an experiment like that. Now, in relativity, um, what LIGO has seen already is what I call here number one, namely instantaneous displacement. So a wave packet comes through, the curvature changes, we see that the geodesics move with respect to each other, the test mass is basically in LIGO, and this has been recorded by laser interferometry, you can change, uh, measure how the distances between these test masses. So number one has been recorded now many times, so uh, this is usually a fraction of a second uh, that this wave packet comes traveling through. Now, number two has been um, derived theoretically and uh, predicted, but we hope that LIGO or Virgo, et cetera, will see that in the near future. So this is a memory effect. So what happens is actually that when the wave package passes, there's a permanent change in the space time. We call this the memory, meaning that the, um, the geodesics or here, the test masses will be permanently displaced according to that. So the first time this was um, derived was in the 70s by Sildovich and Polnareff in a linearized setting. We call this the ordinary memory. And then in the fully nonlinear setting, Chris Adulo at the beginning of the 90s derived um, the fully nonlinear case. So for a while, people thought this is a linear and nonlinear version of the same thing. But with Garfinkel, we showed that actually what we call ordinary memory, going back to Sildovich and Polnareff, is a different has a different source than the null memory going back to Christodoulou. Actually, there's a lot of work that has come into that. Interesting, let me point out a paper by Lasky uh, and collaborators of 2016. So they are trying to stack, let's say, uh, black hole merger events to find memory with LIGO. Just very briefly, there, if you add, let's say, electromagnetic waves or neutrino radiation, then we showed that this will add to the memory effect as well. And there's been a huge amount of, let's say, analogs found. We found something in Maxwell equations, Strominger relates memory to soft theorems um, and asymptotic symmetry, et cetera. So there's a huge investigation of this topic. Let me not maybe not go into that. So I think there's a, a lot of interesting work, but maybe just go what is new here from our perspective. So let me maybe introduce again the structures at, at uh, null infinity. So what I have here, this delta x is there's not a Laplace in here. It's just the delta x is a permanent displacement in such a detector, just a delta in in the 
in the displacement that we find. Um, this is related to some of these shears at null infinity. So this chi I have on the right hand side, that is related to some of the shears that I introduced. And if you have a space time which is decaying fast enough, so this is actually the shear um, of this space time, but in our slowly decaying space times, it's related to the shear, but it's, it's a little bit different here. So what I wanna say, there is this object related to the shears at null infinity, which is giving us basically the permanent displacement of test masses. So D zero here is the initial distance between the test masses. And so here we have the distance R. So basically what we need to do, we need to really investigate the right-hand side. So, so far, what we have known is for, let's say space times of, which are called crystal Kleinman space times or generally, which are decaying like one over R, uh, to Minkowski at infinity. So there's a so-called, it's, it's right, if you like, there's some simple structure for the memory effect. So structure meaning um, there's the ordinary memory, there's the null memory, all of these um, effects are finite and there's only a certain type of, let's say, um, source or a certain type of, a certain type of structure, which looks pretty simple actually. And so on the other hand, if we, go to very general space time. So where your initial data decays very slowly, like in these space times, and you look at that uh, class of solutions, there's a completely new universe opening up. So on the right hand side, there's new structures and actually have some growing effects. And that's what I'm, I'm, I want to show you now. So there's a, it's like if you cross the threshold of one over R decay, something else shows up, something else kicks in. And I should tell you what we mean by electric and magnetic, it's just names at this point, but in the Einstein equations, right? So if you look at the wild curvature, so you can decompose the wild curvature into something we call electric and magnetic part. So the first part here is um, what we call the electric part. And the second part here is what we call the magnetic part. So here, these are just the volume elements with respect to the four dimensional, the three dimensional um, portion of the space time. So, and then of course, if you look at the spatial separation, which you can just write down, you, you can write down a Jacobi equation, the part of the curvature which governs the spatial separation is actually coming from the electric part. And now in the rest of the maybe 10 minutes, so rho, you remember this curvature component rho, this is a specific electric part of the curvature and sigma is a specific magnetic part of the curvature. Now it uh, will play an important role in what follows, what are the sources of these um, gravitational radiation? All right, so this I have said already, and maybe let me just remind us. So if you look at outgoing radiation, the chi hat bar, this shear will be the dominating um, geometric object for the incoming radiation, the chi hat will be the dominating uh, geometric object. And we will talk about this electric and magnetic parity of memory for the Einstein vacuum equations and uh, the rest I will just cite. So here is a first approach trying to uh, explaining what is this all about. I will give you a theorem later, but this is the first approach in explaining what's going on. So remember this chi minus minus chi plus I claim is related to the permanent displacement of test masses, which we call memory effect. So in a simplified version, we could say at null infinity, I plus, well, um, the first point here, so this include, it includes terms which are sourced from the electric part of the curvature, and that is always present. If you have slow decay or fast decay, that's always there. What is new here is that this will also include terms which are sourced by the magnetic part of the curvature, the sigma, and this is not there for the crystal Kleinman space times, it's not there for the fast decay, this is only opening up for the very slow decay. So there's stuff coming in from this magnetic part of the curvature. So let me maybe just introduce on S2. So if I take the divergence, so again, the slash is always I'm on the sphere S2 at null infinity. So the operator divergence on the sphere of this object. So let me just call this C. And then a very uh, short version means, well, there will be equations how C is determined where divergence of C will involve structures coming from the electric part only, and the curl C involves structures coming from the magnetic part only, and other things. 
So in the remaining few minutes, I'm going to walk you through the ideas of the proof and maybe also show the structure coming enough to explain what each uh, step means and show you then the, well, the, the theorem in a, in a more mathematical way. But what I want to say is that whatever I call electric is there for all these um, classes of space-times. What I call magnetic only opens up if you go to slow decay. So again, here we go to the Bianchi equation. So maybe let me just... Uh, let me just go here. The Bianchi equations, I, I get rid of the lower order terms. I have to, I can show that I can bound them fine. So the highest order terms have this kind of behavior. And we have curvature component, leading order curvature component coupled with the shear. And if I look at that and I want to take limited null infinity, the R to minus five halves is a problem, but I can show um, after some computation, I have one piece which looks a little bit better, but still another piece which is not so nice. So let me shut bring everything which is uh, leading order to the left-hand side. And because I know that the right-hand side here, the divergence of beta and this object is actually decaying nicely, namely like R to the minus three, U to the minus one half. Because of that, I know that on the left-hand side, actually, I know that the structures that are problematic will cancel out. So from that perspective, I can now go and try to investigate a little bit further what's actually contributing here at that level. So for the row three, one can show that I have now at lower order terms, a lot of these structures on the right hand side that I introduced earlier. The only thing to remember is that, well, the structure on the right hand side here, this row one half, this goes like R to the minus one plus some U decay um, that will have some impact in a moment. So let me say that if you have stronger decay then all of these terms, row one, beta, F and T will not be there, will be zero. So you will go, um, well, one of them will be there, the R to the minus three, the, the F decay will be there, but D, beta, and one half not, and only the R to the minus three decay will actually give you something at null infinity. But there's more terms now that will contribute from these lower order terms. And so when I take now the limit of this equation, maybe here, so I take number 57 multiplied by R to the three and take the limit at null infinity. So then I call the left-hand side P3, which is just the limit, it's just the definition, I give it that name. And if I integrate that at null infinity with respect to U, that's gonna be my P. So this is nothing else but a function which is defined on S2 cross R. There's of course an additive constant which or function which will come in, but this will drop out later when we take the limit, we will integrate this from minus two plus infinity over all of null infinity. Anyway, so I take this limit and I have a limiting equation. So this limiting equation has now a lot of information for us uh, ready. So if I look at this limiting equation and I integrate with respect to the, let's say the retarded time U, then I have on the left-hand side um, a struct. So on the left-hand side, remember that's my P, which is actually given like that, uh, three, uh, the U integral of this. So then I will have terms of all kinds of sorts. I try to simplify and group things a little bit. And you should think of that, that the first portion here will grow uh, in U. That's a portion which is still independent of U, but will not grow or decay in U at null infinity, and then terms that will decay in U. So why is this important? So let's do something with this equation. So if I define chi three, the derivative of, um, chi hat with respect to you and take the corresponding limit at null infinity here times r squared. Then I define chi to be the u integral. So then I have some limiting equations. So psi is the, in, the corresponding limit of the chi hat bar. So I have integral equations, maybe I jump to 68 here, which look like that. So on the left-hand side, so the first portion, that's a portion that comes from the left-hand side of the equation where we have portions that are sourced by the curvature component row and portions which are sourced by these two shears that come in. And I have a psi squared I integrate. So that's basically energy radiated to infinity by the gravitational wave. And I have this on the right hand side. So if I look at all these structures, maybe the only thing to remember here is that I can um, go deeper into these structures and identify terms let's say of highest order that will grow with square root of u. Namely, if I look at that, if I integrate, so I'll have a memory effect. So I can 
relate this, I can solve an equation of null infinity and relate this to this permanent displacement. But when I integrate, I see that this leading order term here actually is growing like square, back, like square root of u. So remember what I told you about the dynamical and non-dynamical parts. Let's do the same game just briefly for the p components here. So meaning that, um, let me take a point u0 at the sphere at infinity and look at the value of p at u0. So then I take p at u and I take the corresponding point for some, for right, at, at u, and then I, I look, I keep u0 fixed and I let u go to infinity, for instance, plus infinity. So then this value, this difference between p at u and p at u0 will grow with square root of u or absolute value of u. So in this is something new that you have grow, but interesting enough, so I think I have to shortcut a little bit, you can do something similar for the, um, for the magnetic part. So you can compute yourself through the magnetic part of the Bianchi equations and find that I have a component up here of the source by the magnetic part of the curvature, which gives me a corresponding equation actually for the curl of that uh, divergence of this object. So maybe I should um, summarize things here. So what that, does that all mean? So maybe let me put things together. So what, we, what I can show you next is I derived some equations at null infinity coming from the electric part of the curvature and one coming from the magnetic part of the curvature. And what I say is that this displacement here, the chi minus minus chi plus, which shows up here on the right hand side, is actually determined by a set of equations on the sphere at null infinity. So with other words, so there exist functions phi and psi where again, the divergence of this object is given by this nabla phi and the corresponding operator here uh, of psi. And if again, I call C the divergence of this difference, then the divergence of C is equal to the Laplacian of the first phi function and the curl is equal to the Laplacian of the psi function. That's a very simple, I mean, uh, statement that you can show. Finally, the permanent displacement of your test masses will be the chi minus minus chi plus, which is a solution of this system at null infinity. And the most important thing here is that the diff system, the number 83, you always have that, but the curl system, if you have a stronger decay, will always be zero. That you have anything on the right hand side of 82 is really kicking in at, let's say, slower decay than one over R um, in the metric. And you have actually a growing leading order term of square root of U, giving you a displacement that will grow with a square root of U at the leading order for these B space times. So number 82 would be zero for the things we have known so far, which fast decay, but who is something new coming in? There's a lot of more structure, but maybe I, I don't go into that. What is new is really here, we have a contribution to the memory effect from this magnetic part of the curvature. And not only the, um, is there just one contribution, there's a contribution at leading order that diverges at square root of u. And there's a lot of other terms showing up, up at different leading or up at different subleading orders. Moreover, I mean, not, there's only certain terms are finite in this uh, calculations, but a lot of these new terms are growing. And that's um, not that's not happening if you have a fast decay, but that's happening if you have very very slow decay of your space times. Okay, maybe I'm out of time. Let me say you can generalize this easily to the neutrino radiation. So I couple neutrino radiation, and you get also contributions. So first of all, the null fluid does respect this very slow decay. So you can solve the Einstein equations like that, and you do get some extra con contributions also from there. So there's a lot of interesting questions. I'm more than happy to tell you more about that, but maybe I'll stop here and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lydia. Um, <clears throat> thank you for a nice talk. Uh, are there any questions? So maybe I'll venture a, a question. Um, so I think our, well, 
We heard a little bit a lot about your work from Professor Yao before, mm -hmm. and he mentioned that some of the predictions should be observable at LIGO. Right. Is that uh, something you can say a little bit about? Or are yeah. they going to? Yeah. Uh, right. We hope so. So, first of all, I mean, when you talk to the people at LIGO, so there's, you need um, for the memory effect per se, right? So, what they have observed so far, the sensitivity needed for the detection of the uh, gravitational wave so far was something like the field strength, basically your delta lambda over lambda has to be of the order 10 to the minus 21. And for the memory per se, just any kind of memory, you would need 10 to the minus 22. So just a little bit more. And it also turns out that probably you have, um, well, more lower frequency events, but actually I'm looking at the moment at something that might be detectable at higher frequency. I'm, I'm not yet sure about that. But basically, you would expect that, um, first of all, what you call the Christodoulou memory, for instance, in the pure Einstein vacuum equations, if you have, let's say, black holes, neutron stars colliding, not in a huge neutrino cloud, but maybe in an almost vacuum, so that this will show up in, in LIGO. And then we have some work together with Poning Chen, S.T. Yao, and Garfinkel that we looked at various combinations, for instance, of um, the electromagnetic field added on or neutrinos. And we also hope that, say, in neutrino mergers, that you will see that this will add, be added on. But I actually hope that some of these new events will also be detectable, which means if you think about it, so I, I, I was talking about these growing effects, right? So, of course, nothing will explode. These are very tiny effects if you look at how things scale. But what that means is, if you think of what has been known before in the Christodoulou case, in his uh, type of memory, so these are all finite uh, effects and, and very tiny. So here, what will happen is, um, so here is maybe a physical uh, uh, way of saying things of the physicists in the audience. So some physicists liked to think of this like if you subtract, let's say, everything from where we are, we're in a Minkowski space, the gravitational wave comes through, you're again in a Minkowski space, but then you have this permanent displacement, but this is a different Minkowski space. So a lot of physicists try to think of this as you have a transformation from one Minkowski space to another. And so that's what, but this does not work here anymore. So instead of what you have, you have maybe a Minkowski space, but now you have this memory, which will be growing like the square root of you. So your space will be constantly changing. So, and what this means is if you have this finite effects, that's one thing, but if you have now, for instance, this black hole mergers, which are in a extended neutrino clouds, which are extended over very large um, regions in the universe. So you would expect to see some of my new actually uh, events in the sense that when you measure the memory, that will, it will have this growth. And it could be at the leading order like square root of u, but actually there are many sub leading orders that I also didn't go into detail that could also show up. So it doesn't have to be the, the, lead, the most uh, extreme term, but depending on the extent, extent of these neutrino clouds, we expect that some of these effects in the future, I hope, uh, will be observable, yes. Is it, um, if you have something that they should be able to observe, is it hard to get them to actually try to observe it? <laughs> uh, no, no, I think, at, at least for the Christodoulou memory, so the, let's say the uh, the first target. So in the meantime, when I talk to people from LIGO, it's on their to-do list. Mm -hmm. And still, one thing that has been a problem is on the, let's say, low frequency on, on Earth. So this is where all the noise is. So the low frequency, they have to filter out a lot of noise and they have to go to the perfect sensitivity in the frequency range that where you hope to observe it. Um, but here, don't, I mean, still, I think they are looking for it. So, I mean, I've been talking to uh, the people at LIGO. Uh, the question is, when will they see it? <laughs> <laughs> right. it. I think it's exciting that the, the measurements are getting better and better. I think LIGO has been one of the really big breakthroughs in, in the past, uh, well, yeah. century probably. I mean, this is for the century. Yeah, that's terrific. Yeah. So interesting, I think that the, the new uh, thing which really has come out here is that if you look at, again, traditionally at fast decay or some sources which are stationary outside of a compact set, then you expect um, to see this behavior like in the Christodoulou memory, for instance. If you have 
sources which have, as I said, a huge neutrino cloud, but for a very slow decay, then you expect some of my new behavior to be seen at, at different leading orders. So that, that remains to be investigated. Hmm. That's, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So does anybody else have any questions they'd like to ask? Well, I have a naive question. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, do you expect there to be these large neutrino clouds? Is that's that a good question. Like yeah. That's a good question. So at least for some of these sources, it seems that there are really uh, large neutrino clouds present. Uh, and then there's another question. So there's, un, there's this is, I have some of the open questions here also. So for instance, it's not clear, right? So if you have, <clears throat> if you look at galaxies, this is another question. Galaxies have huge uh, halos of dark matter, etc. So another question would be, well, would that be another place where this um, such effects could play a role? Yes or no? That's an open question. But uh, huge neutrino clouds, I mean, they are known to exist, exist in certain circumstances, but um, the question is how, how often would you see a binary black hole merger, a binary neutron star merger outside of such a, a huge cloud? That's a, I don't think we, we know very well, but they exist. Okay, um, are there any further questions? So, well, maybe we can thank Lydia again. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> and, um, yeah, well, thank you everybody for coming. I know uh, Lydia has, a, I've seen your schedule. You have a lot of other meetings with people this week. So, sure. <laughs> right, so. No, but it was yeah. great to see uh, all of you at least online. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Lydia. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <clears throat>